This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It is a marketing communication, is not for onward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. Past performance does not predict future returns, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only. References made to individual securities do not constitute a recommendation to buy, sell or hold any security, investment strategy or market sector and should not be assumed to be profitable. Janice Henderson Investors, its affiliated advisor or its employees may have a position in the securities mentioned. Hello and welcome to Your Biggest Investment, a podcast mini-series from Janice Henderson Investors that explores how the financial decisions you make today can help you build the future you want for your children. Throughout the series, we've been speaking to parents about some of the common financial challenges they have faced and how they've gone about resolving them. In this third and final episode, we're going to speak to parents Kate and Rob to find out how, over their lives together, they've dealt with a number of unexpected events, which are likely to affect all of us from time to time, and the impact that these events have had on their family life, their finances, and their plans for the future. Kate and Rob Cottrell, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. So let's start by painting a little bit of a picture about yourselves. Kate, let's start with you. Tell me about yourself. I am in my mid-40s. I have a career in marketing. I've been working in marketing for about 25 years. Rob and I have been together about 19 years now, and we have three strapping young sons um, who are aged 16, 14, and 11, and keep us very busy. Um, They're bundles of energy and very busy boys in terms of their social lives their sporting lives a lot going on there outside of work i'm a very active person as well i love doing lots of exercise have um, plenty of hobbies to keep me busy brilliant okay and rob tell me a bit about yourself so i am a little bit older than kate i've just turned 50 this summer so feeling very very mortal right now Um, i work in financial compliance i've been doing that for about 25 years across a range of different entities and a range of different countries, as it, as it turns out. I am rather rugby obsessed. I've coached all of my kids through their early rugby careers, just finished the last one, and um, decided I had a bit of unfinished business on the pitch. So at the ripe old age of 50, I've just started playing again. We got back into it. Okay. Right. Well, Kate, do you want to tell us just a little bit more about your children? Because they sound very active. Is it is it quite a strain on your finances? Yeah. So all three boys have been indoctrinated into rugby, which is probably their primary passion in life by their father, <laughs> which I'm fully supportive of. And so that that's probably the big thing that they spend a lot of their time doing. But they also have hobbies like sailing. And we are lucky to be a family that enjoys an active holiday. So we, we like to ski and we like to have active holidays and travel. So, you know, costs do come with that sort of lifestyle that we've chosen. All three of them go to a private school near us now and obviously that's a draw on the finances Um, three sets of school fees will be a big thing in our lives for two years while we have all of them at the same school we have a two-year period where we're paying for three children at private school okay so yeah I can see there are a few different things that would definitely drain the pot a little bit there how have you generally approached your your finances I mean do you do you have an investment strategy around them yes well for the it's funny when you become a parent, um, your needs become less important, important, the kids' needs become more important. So I have to admit I wasn't a fantastic saver when I was younger and throughout the first part of, of my career. Fortunately, I married an accountant's daughter and that started to change at that point. But one thing that we did do very early on was take advantage of the child trust funds as they were there. Just started putting a little bit aside each month for the kids, knowing that, you know, where we wanted to go in terms of education and also, you know, university as well. It felt like it was miles and miles and miles away. But here we are, you know, our our eldest is 16. He's two years away from going to university now. So that was, I think, probably our our one key choice in terms of saving to help with future financial costs of the kids going early, even if it's a little bit that you can put aside, uh, you know, the power of compounding, just try and 
get some money aside as early as possible and, and 18 years later hopefully it, it, it amounts to something. Gosh yeah so school fees in university two classic longer term goals there that, that people tend to have for their children. Kate were you quite a good saver then? They say opposites attract. I, as he says, am an accountant's daughter. I think we met and fairly early on when we decided to move in together, I introduced Rob to the joy of the spreadsheet and budgeting, <laughs> which we still do to this day. We budget actually very carefully, which I think over the years has really helped us to put money away into either investments or savings and allowed us to make the decisions we want to make. And I think in particular, having that approach and actually a bit of discipline around money has allowed us to progress up the property ladder and to make the decision for our children to to go to a private school. There's been a lot of work that's gone into that. Okay, all right. So, Rob, let's get then on to your career a little bit. Do you want to tell me a bit about your job? Yes, so uh, as I said, I'm in uh, compliance, been a head of compliance for about the last 10 years, so quite a long career in that. I've been very lucky in some of the places I've worked and I've built a very successful career. Uh, I recognise you know, my good fortune in that. It's come with a lot of work. I enjoy what I do. I see myself doing it for, for a little while to come <laughs> yet. Uh, our youngest is still young. Um, but, you know, it's, it comes with its own pressures. It comes with its own downsides as well. It's a very pressurized environment. It's very long hours, can be quite confrontational. So you have to take the rough with the smooth, I think. And this is within financial services. Would you, would you say it's quite a, a cyclical industry? Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think we're probably seeing that right now with uh, the UK stumbling into uh, what looks like to be a pretty deep recession. You, you know, you don't know. It can be very, very volatile. This, uh, we've had a very benign marketplace for a long time with lots of cheap money, but you know, that can end very quickly. Okay. And then, of course, you know, within this episode, we're having a little look at life's unexpected event, and you've had a couple of redundancies. So do you, wanna, do you want to tell us about your first redundancy? Yeah, sure. So that was, uh, I worked for a big American hedge fund at the time. And it was through the global financial crisis of, of 2007, 8 and 9. So I guess it, it the environment was there for something bad to happen to me, uh, but I didn't really expect it. It did come out of the blue. I went in to work as normal on a Monday morning, got into work at sort of half past seven in the morning. And by half past nine, I was walking down the, the street, uh, making the call to Kate to say, oh, I'm really sorry, I've just been um, made redundant. So it was, it was pretty much out of the blue. But at the same time, you know, I, it, I wasn't the only one. This was in March 2000 and everyone was cutting costs and being in financial services at that point was uh, you know it, it it was quite rocky yes i can imagine and and i suppose you're also being made redundant into an economic downturn as well so there's there's sort of added anxieties around that i mean how did you how did you feel um i felt terrible i felt guilty primarily i thought you know at the time we had charlie our eldest wasn't yet two Finn, our brand new baby, wasn't yet one. Uh, we had fairly recently bought, you know, our first family home together. I hadn't been with Kate for a huge amount of time, so my saving habits had not <laughs> recovered. So we were really, you know, we were really stretched anyway. We didn't have a lot of savings behind us. So I felt guilty at, at having put the family in this position. You know, it, 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 it naturally hits your confidence as well. You know, it's all well and good to say global financial crisis, loads of people are being made redundant, but it does feel personal. And as you say, it was into a, it was into the teeth of a storm. And I just remember, you know, just going to job interview after job interview after job interview, and, and the majority of the jobs just didn't materialize. It wasn't that they necessarily didn't hire me, they just ended up not hiring anyone. So it was, it was really, it was a very, very tough four to six months. Right. Okay. So you were you were fairly anxious, and and in terms of your finances, was there? I mean, you you described the anxiety. Was there quite a lot of pressure in in terms of where your savings were, and at that point? Yes. So you know, when you're made redundant, there is a settlement, but we pretty much had nothing behind us. We put down a deposit on the house, and and you know, we had two young children. We we hadn't been saving a lot, so that settlement got eaten into very very quickly. You know, and it wasn't going to last forever and nobody was hiring. So it really was a case of, well, what do we do now? We have X amount in the bank, which is all from a settlement and it's, it's going pretty quickly. 
We had luckily about nine months earlier to a year taken out some redundancy insurance as well. Rob's really good at being really intuitive about the way the markets are going. And you, you just had an inkling, didn't you, Rob, um, that something was going on and we had taken out insurance. So that was a, another small buffer for us. But as Rob says, it was dwindling fast. Mm. So do you want to describe what that insurance was? Yeah, it was like an income protection thing. We were going back quite a few years, so I'm trying to remember the details. But it was about eight or nine months, probably mid-2008, when you know the markets were in absolute freefall and, and it was just a bad place to be. And I just thought, I wasn't expecting it to happen to me. But that's, you know, I guess that's what insurance is for. It's for the unexpected as much as anything. So it was a relatively cheap policy that paid, I think, about two thirds of my salary for a period of about six months. So it did definitely cushion the blow a little bit. Uh, and it was uh, you know, almost just a bit of luck. I just, just thought, well, it's not going to cost me much and it might really help at some point. But we actually ended up having to make a really drastic decision because Rob was really struggling to find work because of the climate. And we ended up looking abroad. So we moved to the Middle East. Really? OK. Well, do you want to tell us a, bit, a little bit more about that? I remember we got to sort of about four four or five months into this process and nobody was hiring. And I distinctly remember sitting around the kitchen table with Kate saying, look, we've got to change change the, the paradigm here. We've got to do something different. And we pretty much got a map out. And thought well, we need we need to get out of this country because it's you know it's it's not good here. Can't get a visa for the US. Don't really want to go to Asia because you live in tiny little flats and, and you know we've got we've got two small children. Oil still seems to be going well, so why don't we think about the Middle East? Um, you know it's 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 only a seven hour flight, not a you know fifteen hour flight to to Hong Kong. Um, so let's have a look at that. And they still seem to be going great guns over there because they have a an industry and an economy that's not fired necessarily by financial services. So I, I got a job offer in Qatar and we moved to Doha in late 2009, which was a little bit of a false start. It was, it's a tough country to, to be in. The job was fine, but um, it, it was, you know, it was quite a tough country to certainly for Kate to exist in and the kids. And it was, oh my God, it was hot. You know, it was in the in the mid fifties in, in in summer, so it was it was pretty brutal. And then I moved from there, and we spent two years in Dubai, which was which was uh, actually great fun. Um, it was a good place to be. It was much more developed for an expat community, so there was there was a, a lot more for us and the children to do. And in fact, that's where we had our third child. And really, that move sort of saved our bacon because we were at a point when we decided on Middle East um, in terms of the move. We were thinking about putting the house on the market. We were about to lose the home that we'd just bought. And we're about to, you know, really ha have to make some very difficult decisions. And so the Middle East saved our bacon. And, you know, we had a period out there, certainly the, the latter two years in Dubai, where, yes, we had some fun um, and we could have a nice lifestyle. And of course, um, you don't pay any tax over there. So we were able to recoup a little bit and reset. And after three years, we came back to the UK. Rob um, worked really hard at sort of re-entry and getting a job back in the UK market. And the same for me. And, and we managed to just have three years setting ourselves up again, really. OK, so Kate, you at that stage, you were, you were focused on looking after the kids. But, but when you came back, you then, you then got a job again. Is that right? Yeah, so um, I wasn't actually allowed to work in the Middle East just because of the rules around the, the visa situation, particularly in Qatar, actually. I, there was, it was a very complicated cultural situation over there. I had always worked. I found it very odd not working for three years, but I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a newborn, so I had plenty to occupy me for three years. And the minute we knew we were coming back, I jumped straight back into work and uh, loved it actually. So it was good to be be back and feel like I was getting my career back on track after three years. Okay, so it sounds like at that stage you then started to come out of this what was quite an intense situation around your your finances. Did you what lessons did you feel that you learned from that experience? I think primarily for me it was the whole experience would have been easier to navigate had we already built up a little bit of a buffer ourselves had we not had to be so reactive to to what was happening so that was a that was a lesson for us and and really sort of spurred 
our sort of mentality around saving after that. It also, you know, it's clear that you can't predict the future. You don't know what's going to happen and you can have the most wonderful mature savings plan that you're going to put aside X amount per month, you know, forevermore. But for that per- that three year period, we didn't, we barely saved at all. We, you know, the, your priorities change and they need to change pretty quickly. So our priorities were, let's try and keep our house. Let's try and keep food on the table. Um, and if you have to pause what you're doing, your wonderfully constructed plan, well, you know, that's just part of it. That's part of life switch tapestry. So, but what we did learn is, is the moment you're able to start putting stuff aside again, please do, because uh, you never know what's going to happen again a few years down the line. And you mentioned, I mean, you had a little bit of a payout from a short-term income protection insurance. Did you, have you ever thought about any other kind of insurance income replacement? Because you can get, get ones for mortgage replacement as well. Do you ever thought about those? Well, I'm lucky enough to have quite a few of those things wrapped into my uh, compensation package these days. But if I didn't, then those were things, they're usually relatively cheap products. And, you know, it's one of those things you, you kind of, resent paying the money on a monthly basis right up until the point you need it and then you're really glad you've spent that that relatively small amount of money on on a monthly basis you you then had a, a second redundancy didn't you this this year did you did you feel like you were better prepared then this time around yeah absolutely absolutely you know we got back from the middle east in 2012 so i had sort of a 10 years of of this new way of thinking about investing and, and really trying to put more and more away in our savings. So this time round, the result of a merger and acquisition position in that the company I worked for was acquired. Uh, I'm, I was the head of compliance. They, the acquiring company already had a head of compliance, two into one doesn't go. So I kind of was, I was more prepared for this both mentally. I knew it was coming. It was a uh, six months down the line till it actually materialized, but everybody was fairly above board about what was going to happen. So mentally I was prepared for it a lot a lot more and financially we were prepared for it a lot more um, irrespective of the fact that our costs are probably higher now because of the kids and the stage that they're they're in our, our savings plan had been working for 10 years and, and we were in a much better position and it really was I don't know whether we'd have been in this position if we hadn't if I hadn't been made redundant the first time because that really spurred us on to you know whatever you can just try and save a little bit away okay and then Kate, I just want to get on to to you a little bit because you had a different type of unexpected event. You received some bad news this year, didn't you? Yeah, so I have had some health problems this year. I've had a brush with cancer. And uh, although I can sit here now and say I think it's probably going to be okay, at the time that was a very scary thing as a mother of three and, a um, you know, a part with a partner in my life. And I was lucky in that the type of cancer I had, although very, very aggressive, caught um, very early. So I was able to have some surgery to sort it out and hopefully the prognosis is looking good. A year later, it would have been a very different picture. Um, So I've been lucky, but it has been another jolt really for us. Um, It coincided almost exactly with the time that Rob was made redundant again. So quite a stressful period for us. I do have critical illness cover, so I'm, I'm currently in the, the process of, of putting a claim through on that. And mercifully, I didn't have to take too much time off work, so we didn't really lose too much of my income through that period this time. But it, it doesn't half make you reassess, A, what's important, and, you know... I, in, in some respects, I, me being the sensible financial one has probably relaxed a little bit because I'm having a bit, a few more moments of actually let's live for the day, and and let's let's go on holiday and let's enjoy this time together. But we have now got the backdrop, as Rob said, of that sort of more secure financial position that we work very hard at over the years. You know, we've both worked a lot of our adult lives to to get us here so and and can you describe in terms of your career as well i mean is is this a big part of of your income now that's in terms of the family income yeah yeah so when the children were younger i obviously had three years in the middle east where i didn't work at all but actually the rest of the time i've always contributed and pre-covid rob was uh bless him a, a weekend dad really 
So he would sort of almost leave on a Monday and return on a Friday um, because he had a big job. So I was sort of scooping up the majority of the childcare when the kids were younger and therefore working part time when they were young. So three, four days a week. And now that the children are all at secondary school, I'm really cranking my career up again. And, and therefore the income that I can contribute to the household has changed as well. Which is great because I've, I love working. I, I, it is something I actively enjoy and I like to feel that I'm contributing to the household. And do you want to just describe what critical illness cover is? So there's sort of two scenarios that it covers you, you for. One of which is if you pass away, your other half will, will receive a payout on that basis. I pay monthly into my cover and it, it's quite a lot of money actually. So it's quite a big decision to, to start paying into that. Um, but we had a number of friends uh, who sort of hit their 40s and, and had started to have some serious health problems. And I think that just triggered a thought that We couldn't really afford for me to fall over and for us not to have a cushion. So I I can now claim for the certain conditions that you can then claim for and and receive a payout out of a fixed pot from from that policy. Um, So that's what I'm in the process of doing at the moment. Right, Okay. So if you meet certain criteria for certain illnesses that are covered within the policy, then it will pay you a lump sum. Is, Is that basically how it works? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what I'm in the midst of at the moment. Interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, Kate, I'll start with you then, you know, just to sort of wrap things up. What would you say that, you know, you sort of your big lessons from this and and perhaps then how you would have done something differently and therefore what kind of advice you might give um, someone who's listening to this and has got a young family? Rob and I actually, I think, probably both agree on this. I'm not sure I would have done anything differently, which is a, a nice place to be. Um, we've certainly had our ups and downs and challenges, but actually I think we were very resilient and actually quite creative, particularly around the first redundancy in terms of how we could provide for our family. And that move to the Middle East isn't necessarily something everyone would have done, um, but it absolutely was right for us. So I think I can sit here and say I'm really glad with the decisions we took. And I think to sort of add to Rob's um, thought on you know saving when you can, It actually takes a lot of self-control to do that because when you receive a lump sum or things are looking pretty, it's very tempting to just spend. So I think it's having that discipline to to put money away when you can. And I think particularly for the kids, you know, that the child trust funds that are now child child ISAs, um, those are hugely useful. Those are the things that actually are probably going to allow Rob and I to retire because they will cover university fees um, and get the children started on the property ladder. So I I think those have been absolutely invaluable in terms of securing the kids' future and actually the future for Rob and I. And Rob, would you say, I mean, uh, you know, you've put money aside. How would you sort of um, respond to the investing rather than, than saving kind of question? Would you say investing has been a good idea? Yes, I think if you've got a long term horizon, you know, investing is is a good idea. Get good advice would be my advice. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot out there that the financial advice business is, is sort of coming back after a few years of, of not being particularly well developed. You know, it, I think if you've got a long term horizon, there are some really good products out there. There's some really good providers out there. So, you know, I, I'm lucky in that I work in that world. So I feel a little bit privileged in, in, in that sense. I kind of know my way around, around investments. But um, you know, I wish I'd I wish I'd started earlier. I think would be my bigger regret. The first part of my career, the first sort of ten years of my career, where where it was just me, I thought saving was for much older people. You know, right through into my early mid thirties, I thought this was something that my parents did when they hit forty or fifty or something like that. Um, you, you know, the, the the power of compounding investment is is incredibly. Um, well, it's incredibly powerful. And the earlier you start, the more that has a chance to operate. Um, so I wish I'd done something a little bit earlier. If you can make your savings and investments like an automated process, so it's sort of, you, you know, it, you're, you're 20 pounds a month, you're 50 pounds a month, whatever it is just goes out automatically. For me anyway, it becomes slightly more invisible. It doesn't come into your disposable income pot and then you're not tempted to spend it because it's already gone straight into to whichever platform you use. Um, and 
you know, I was always very tempted to spend. So that that was a tool that, that worked for me, was making sure it was sort of out of sight, out of mind. But uh, yeah, just save as early as you can, even if it's tiny bits. And if you're knocked off course, we were, we were really badly knocked off course, you know, work hard, get back on course and then start again. Mm, okay, so don't let those unexpected turns of events turn you off from actually that regular saving, that regular investing and, and drip feeding money into the, into the markets. Absolutely. Okay, well, I think that wraps everything up. Hopefully it's given you some food for thought when it comes to approaching your family finances and dealing with some of those unexpected life events. A very big thank you to Kate and Rob Cottrell for sharing their story with us today and offering us some tips around some of those really difficult moments in life. And to our listeners, we hope you got plenty out of the series when it comes to thinking about building the future you want for yourselves and your family. You can find out more information on planning for your family's financial future by searching Janice Henderson's Biggest Investment or visiting its hub at janicehenderson.com forward slash biggest investment. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and annual report of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend on an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for regulatory record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janice Henderson Investors. Janice Henderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janice Henderson Investors International Limited. Registration number 3594615. Janice Henderson Investors UK Limited. Registration number 906355. Janice Henderson Fund Management UK Limited. Registration number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited. Registration number 2606646. Each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate, London EC2M 3AE, and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, and Henderson Management. S. A. Registration number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitburg L-1273 Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance de Secteur Financier. Janice Henderson, Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright, Janice Henderson Group, PLC. NAV. The total value of the fund's assets, less its liabilities.